All right. I got literally signed out of everything when I got here, so it made everything take a little longer. Uh, let's see. Uh, today, linear regression and least squares. Uh, you've already seen this, but you know, uh, I when I lack announcements, I just reuse the old ones. Uh, unless anybody had any questions about like final exam stuff or any of that, like I said, we'll at least more details on Tuesday, I think is the plan. Um, okay. Uh, I'll also post uh, the recordings of the lectures uh, sometime soon, um, probably, uh, probably before Tuesday, I'll try to get everything that's current up. Uh, but you should have all of them before uh, before you know uh, Friday of next week. Uh, so just to rehash the correlation coefficient, um, and sorry, my voice is kind of washed out today. Uh, I was not out clubbing, despite how it sounds. Um, all right, so the correlation coefficient is referred to as R, usually. Um, like I said before, it's kind of hard to write uh, and make it kind of stand out, but it's a lowercase r. Um, it will range between negative one and one. Uh, and if there's one, it has a, well, let's ask, yeah, so we have actually on here already. So this is very close to one, right? So it's gonna go up and to the right. Um, and if we have a negative, there's negative 0.5, but you know, basically it's gonna go down uh, as it goes to the right. So that's uh, a negative one. And then a zero is kind of like the picture all the way over to the left, uh, where it just looks like a big blob, uh, where everything's kind of all over the place. Uh, so when you have a one, it means there's a, a perfect positive correlation or basically a 45 degree angle. And if it's a negative one, it's a perfect negative correlation. Uh, so 45 degree angle going the other way, um, which is, I don't know, like three, I don't know, 20 something, uh, math failing me. Uh, and zero means there is no, now to be clear, right? No linear association. There may be an association, but it's not linear. Uh, so uh, we're gonna talk about a couple of those hopefully today. Um, so, and to talk about what you can do about that. Uh, and so the way you get to the correlation coefficient is, um, you said before, kind of the reverse way you say it is you convert your Y into standard units, then convert your X into standard units. Uh, and then you take the product of the standard deviation of X and the product and uh, uh, the standard deviation of Y, and then you average the two uh, to get uh, your co uh, correlation coefficient. Or, sorry, you add, average the product. Um, and you measure how the cluster of the scatter is over, around a straight line. So it's just kind of how, how much of a line it looks like versus, uh, I, was re I was looking at the book again uh, as it refers to a football. Uh, that would be an American football specifically um, because obviously an R value of zero is what it looks like in soccer. Um, so, and so it kind of looks like a football uh, with narrower, you know, as it gets closer to a line. Uh, and a couple things to watch out for, um, you know, an association does not equal causation, uh, nonlinearity, right? So as I mentioned, if it's a linear relationship, we can use this correlation coefficient well. Uh, if it's nonlinear, we can't really. Uh, outliers uh, tend to throw off uh, the values um, and some more so than others. And I have a little example of that too. And then this ecological correlation, um, which is kind of a fancy way of saying basically uh, aggregations do not always equal um, the same thing when it's disaggregated. Okay, so, you know, if you're looking at values, the example I showed was uh, math scores in states and a correlation between the reading scores in those states. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that if you you'd get the same correlation, if you looked at individuals across the US, say. All right, so a little demo. And I need to run this all together. A couple of functions to get started. Um, and just kind of as a reminder, you saw them a little bit on that graphic, um, but here's a negative one. Here is a positive 0.5. Uh, and then a negative 0 0.5. Uh, 
And then instead of doing zero, why don't we do negative one, just so it's really obvious. And why are my arrows not working? Um, so obviously it's just the reverse of the positive one. Uh, so referred to as a negative correlation. Um, and there's that. Uh, and then to show kind of the outliers example, uh, we had this example, we talked about this last time, where uh, basically the last point here, right, is it kind of drops off the, the curve quite a lot. Um, and you end up with correlation of zero. But what I think is interesting is if you take the same, you know, kind of the same set of data in a sense, but your outlier is at three instead of kind of over at the end, um, you actually still have a pretty strong correlation of about 0.5. Okay, so, uh, you know, so where those outliers are, kind of the distance they are from the line, all that stuff makes a, a very like large and potentially weird impact on your overall correlation if you're trying to figure it out. So keep that in mind. All right. So in, if X and Y have a correlation of one, then one must cause the other. Uh, is this true or false? Let's say true is left hand and false is right hand uh, for all those people who might be left handed in the classroom. Anyone? Left hands, right hands. So left hand is true, right hand is false. So if there's a correlation of one, does that mean there's causal relationship? All right, so this is false, okay? They do not necessarily have a causal relationship just because they have a correlation of one, okay? They just might rise together, uh, say, um, <clears throat> but it doesn't necessarily mean that they have a causal relationship to each other. Um, so if the correlation of X and Y is close to zero, then knowing one will never help us know the other. Any theories? Let's say uh, true continues to be left hand. This one for you guys. And uh, false is right hand. Uh, one of the reasons I wear a watch is so I can remember this. All right. So this one, I think, is it's almost like a trick question. Uh, this one is false. Okay. So just because they don't have a linear correlation, doesn't mean they don't have a correlation, which is maybe nonlinear, right? So keep that in mind. Uh, like I said, it, it's very easy to get tempted by this kind of question, right? Um, but in fact, you you like you know the answer, right? In that I just said the you know if it's a nonlinear correlation, you'll get a, a, a an R of zero, um, but that you know so you can still predict it. So it's kind of just phrased weirdly. It's like we're taking a standardized test or something. Um, all right, so if X and Y have a correlation of negative 0.8, then they have a negative association. Is that true or false? True is left hand, false is right hand. Need more hands. All right, uh, the chairs are not that tall, so getting your hand up over the chair is probably doable. Uh, this is true, so basically a negative uh, here means a negative association. So words tie nicely together. So that's uh, that's good. All right. So uh, we kind of talked about this before, right? But what we're doing here is we're trying to make predictions. Okay. So uh, if we wanted to predict the number of hospital beds are available using uh, air pollution, let's say. So you know that one. Maybe there is a causal relationship there. But let's say there is a correlation to high amounts of air pollution and you know essentially small numbers of hospital beds right um, so if you if you've been following the news in india lately for example uh where the smog is so bad that um they're literally giving stay-at-home orders uh, mostly in delhi i think um you know this, this is obviously true right a lot of the time so uh but you know one of the things if you can usually measure air pollution and then make a guess about hospital beds because that's a little bit harder to me measure in a sense, right? Because if you have, you know, 50 hospitals, it means you have to call them all up and find out how many beds they have left or how many they have available. Whereas air pollution, you might be able to just go outside and measure it. Um, and then predicting house prices using house size 
So it would stand to reason, right, that a bigger house would equal to a larger house price. Uh, however, take into account rural versus urban, um, you know, my house, which is not very big, right, is still probably quite a bit more expensive than someplace that's three times the size in somewhere in the Midwest in the US, right? Um, so, and, and trust me, I know for sure. Um, another thing you might want to be able to do is predict the number of app users based on the number of app downloads. So again, um, you know, it would stand to reason, right, that there's a causal relationship here, but there may not be, right? Some people may just be downloading the app um, and, you know, they try it for a second and it doesn't meet their needs. Um, you know, like a bunch of the banking apps lately that turned out have malware in them, for example. Um, but uh, so, but there's probably a fair, there's probably a correlation, right? You can probably make a prediction of, you know, if it has a million app downloads, then it's going to have, you know, some number of users that's similar to other million app download uh, applications. All right. Uh, so we talked about nearest neighbor regression. So this is what we did when we um, uh, played around with the Dalton Heights. Um, you know, we said what's nearby uh, may give us an indication of a, a new value in that same area, right? Um, and actually, as you get further into data science, um, there's lots of neat things you can do with that that don't entirely have to do with lines. I can't remember if we're going to, or I'm not sure if we're actually going to reach one of those uh, during this semester, uh, but it'd be really cool because it's one of my favorite techniques. Um, so, and then the graph of the predictions is the graph of averages. So, uh, and when we say the graph of predictions, right? So there's a different, like we have a whole bunch of real data, right? Which shows us the scatter plot. Um, and then we want to put a bunch of predictions on there so that we can see that, you know, um, so it's usually been like a yellow dotted line, right? Those are the predictions. They're not necessarily real values in the data. They're the predictions we're using based on this nearest neighbor technique. And we're going to look at a different way of doing the same thing today. So just to kind of rehash those a little bit. Um, we're going to have a little function, which is basically going to do our nearest neighbor prediction. OK, but it's got some hard coding in there. Uh, because we're going to continue to use the Galton data. So we're going to look at neighbors that are within, you know, a quarter of on either side of whatever the data point is. Um, <coughs> and so we end up with a pretty scatter plot. Oh, come on. All right. Uh, and as you can see, right, we do have what looks like a positive association. Um, and for right now, we're going to say, you know, like this positive association does, you know, would you all agree that it looks like a one ish, right, a one ish slope? Um, because it kind of goes, it does seem to kind of go through the center there. Um, and so this is the, the eyeball technique, right? Of, of trying to do predictions, um, which, you know, is okay, um, but we're gonna find or I'm gonna show, right? Uh, that maybe it's not great in all cases. Um, and so what we can do is we can do our predictions using the nearest neighbor technique. Um, and all we did was run you know we have our real x and y values right but now we take the x and we compute a y value and now we have a new column of y right and this is where we get those yellow dots from so um so for example right um and let me show you up here and uh, not quite fitting but so what this is saying, right, is that if I use an X of 1.5, so about here, um, the Y value will be about 0.9, okay? And so we can, we can kind of take a look at that and see that it would be one and a half, about 0.9. I think that's about right, right? So, you know, ish, you know. But then if we take a look at it more closely, 
we can see that when we actually draw our yellow dots, okay, and we draw our original uh, R value of one, right? Um, if we look at that 1.5, it seems a little weird, right? So the prediction is actually here, not here. Okay, so our, our, our value of one here is not right. Well, maybe not the best fit we can get, okay? So what we can do is take a look at the, the yellow, oops, I forgot I'm supposed to do something here. I can find it. So, Oh, so I was just going to ask, so does anybody have a guess of what R value we could use on that yellow line that might be a better fit? <clears throat> so you know it's positive, right? Because it's going up and to the right. Um, you know it's not all the way up at one. So what might it be? Do you have any you know, ballpark guesses? Point eight here, what do you got? Point four, let's try them both and see what happens. But rather than forcing you to put up with my typing, I will oops. All right. Of course you're oh no, you're wearing blue. And I'm I'm gonna call your shirt green, whether it's actually green or not. So theoretically, that'll give us oh boy, why I don't know what the trick is to make this work all the time. Okay, so oh boy. Uh so we had a, a green line prediction, right? This this is our point eight here, and this is our point four, because you're wearing a blue sweatshirt. Uh so um, you know, so it, it's getting there. I'd say the point eight looks like it's a little bit closer than the uh, point four. Um, but I happen to know because I cheated uh, that the answer is point six. And so we'll see that one. And you can see that's really close, right? At least in kind of the main area where we don't have too many outliers. Um, and the reason I know that for sure is just because the initial table I actually put in 0.6, right? So I cheated and said, give me something that looks like an R value of 0.6. Um, so, but what we wanna know is, okay, that's great. But instead of just guessing nearby, right? And putting every line in there, um, you know, each one, you know, trying it out, uh, is there a way we can actually calculate it? And that's where, so what nearest neighbor regression gives us, right? Is basically a set of points um, and, you know, not necessarily a line, right? So it kind of gives us a, an idea of where a line would be. And this technique is actually going to give us an actual line, okay? So uh, I think this looks really complicated, but this SU here is just standard units, okay? So it's just a reminder that X and Y need to be in standard units. Excuse me. So uh, if we multiply the R by X in standard units, we'll get y. Um, and so what this is, is a, um, what do we call it? A, uh, oh, sorry, let me say this first. So this is the correlation, right, between them. Um, and then what we have with the whole thing is what's referred to as the regression line. Or And so this is a, a function for a line. <laughs> I couldn't think of the word function, but um, so, but it's measured in standard units, describes the deviation of X from zero, because when we're doing standard units, everything's right around zero, um, and the uh, deviation of Y from the zero. Uh, and so, and basically it's not true for all the points, right? Which we can, we could have guessed, right? This is kind of a way of looking for, you know, a line that roughly goes through there, 
not necessarily one that's going to be perfect. Um, you know, we hope it's going to be close, uh, but it's not necessarily perfect. So, all right, and then kind of another way of looking at the similar problem. Um, so, if we estimate y, this is how we get to the estimation of y in standard units, okay? So, we take the estimate of y minus the average of y, and we get the standard deviation, or uh, yeah, the standard deviation of y. <coughs> Sorry. Um, same with x. Um, and ultimately, we can actually make it a little easier by saying, okay, um, you know, the left hand in the prior equation, right, is the slope, and the right hand is the intercept, um, or x times the intercept. Or, sorry, x is not possible. Um, x plus the intercept times the slope will also give us y if we take this version of the function and kind of break it apart uh, so that we can simplify it. Um, because uh, I kind of put these a little out of order. Um, so, because if we look at how we get to the intercept and how we get to the slope, then we can get to an estimate of y. All right. So, kind of going back a little bit. You know, so what we're trying to get to is that estimate of y. So we're, um, you know, algebraically pulling this this function apart, right? Until we basically end up with y on the left and everything else on the right, so that we can actually calculate it because we know what x is, but that's the only other variable that we have. We have r as well, um, and so we can kind of pull it apart until we end up with basically this. And and the, the same is true, generally speaking, right? Um, for uh, kind of the original units, it's just that it, we can't calculate it as well over here. <clears throat> so what we want to do is move to standard units, and then we can shift it back later, right, to get to the real data value. Uh, so yeah, I was going to show this now, theoretically. All right, so these are just the ones we did before. So we just have a little, um, you know, from last time, this is how we calculate the correlation, and that's how we convert to standard units. Um, and it's just some functions for that to make it easier. So one, the correlation depends on the standard unit conversion uh, to make it work. All right, so let's see. So for the slope, Leave the oh, I didn't even leave the comment in. Um, so the slope is hopefully you can read that. <coughs> Sorry, my allergies, I think, are killing me. Um, okay, so the slope is equal to r times the standard, uh, the, uh, the standard deviation of y over the standard deviation of x. Um, and so we need to turn that into a function. And so the first thing we need to do is get R, which we have a nice convenient function for, where we can just pass the table that was passed in, right, to the correlation function with the X and the Y that are passed in. And then, we need to get to the standard deviation for y um, and the same for x. And then we just kind of plug that into the formula that we have above, right? So we just return r times y divided by x. And so that's how we get the slope. Okay. So, you know, like there, there's a lot of stuff in here we don't actually probably need. We could, you know, we could shove them all in the return tree. I don't like doing that because I tend to ask bugs. Um, so breaking them up makes it a little easier for me. So a lot I usually do is kind of calculate the individual pieces and then do the full math at the end. Um, and then if we talk about the intercept, that's also should be pretty straightforward in that we know um, the intercept is equal to the average of y times 
no, sorry, minus the slope times the mean of x or the average of x. So again, we kind of just do exactly the same thing. We just calculate each piece. Um, so the first thing we do, we get our tabs right. Oh. And so what we do is get the average of x, which is just the NP mean um, using uh, off of the column, you know, version of the of the x column. Okay. I thought the coffee would help my speaking better. All right, and then we do basically do the same exact thing for to get the average for y. And then we plug that into our formula above almost, right? Because we need the slope. So we got to call the function we just wrote over here uh, to get the slope. And I totally, minus sign is really throwing me off there. Um, looks like a dot. Uh, so, uh, so that's how we get our intercept. So between the slope and the intercept, we know from over here that we can get the estimate of y by taking the slope times x plus the intercept. That seems pretty handy, right? That's a very mathy way of, of getting to the same answer without having to do guesswork. So just to kind of show you first up, well, if I ran this thing and actually had the functions, that would help. So um, using that same table that I was using before, so uh, it's a table that is generated with an R of 0 0.6, then the slope um, passing in that table and the, uh, the X and Y columns, uh, that function there makes two columns X and Y and just randomly populates it to make sure it has a 0.6 R value. And it's up at the top if you want to look at how it works. Um, but as you can see, right, it, it's real close to 0.6, okay, which is what you kind of expect. And then does anybody have a guess what the intercept is going to be? We talked about this last time, but I haven't really talked about it this time. Any idea what the intercept's going to be? Remember, we're using standard units. So where is this line that we're going to create going to cross uh, x equals 0? No, y equals 0. Sorry. I said it backwards all the time. Like right and left hand, I always get the x and y backwards. Any ideas? All right, let's find out. Um, so that's not terribly useful. Uh, so why don't we just do this and turn off caps lock. And as you can see, it's basically zero. Okay, so remember when we're doing the standard units, um, what we did was we shifted everything to be around zero. So the intercept line is going to be, or the intercept point is going to be. All right, so then we can now draw a pretty picture. Um, and so in this case, what we did was, if you notice this line here, we incorporated our new function, okay? So instead of using the, whatever it was called, NN predict values or whatever, um, to get our blue line, okay? We actually calculated the intercept, and we calculated the uh, the slope, and then we drew a line, right? Because all you need for a line is the slope and the intercept, um, and we call it blue. And as you can, you, hopefully, you can see here, right? I also drew a red line that was literal slope zero point six, which we know is the is the right answer. Um, and you can see it's, it's basically right on top of it, right? So our calculated mechanism is really really close. The variability between them. Is the same as that variability and whatever that is like 28 up there um it's this variability and this variability here which is basically python falling down on the job in doing its arithmetic right which we talked about early early on in the semester that when you're talking about sufficiently complicated numbers you know but basically numbers that are wide enough uh it starts falling apart uh from a math perspective so 
um, you know, I probably would have gotten even closer if I wrapped our intercepts into like a rounding function or something like our intercept and our slope into a rounding function, uh, because then it would be closer to what we like want it to be, even though it's less accurate in a sense. So it's kind of one of those things where you want to be careful uh, what you wish for. All right, so using kind of a more real world example, we go back to that uh, Galton, uh, the heights prediction stuff. So we have the mid parent with the child. Um, so the average of the two parents predicting the child height. And what we messed around with, I think last time, um, is okay, we create uh, a prediction function, which basically, and I'm sorry, I thought we were reusing the function from before, but so yeah, it's, it's 0 0.5 here and 0 0.5 here. It wasn't a quarter, which is what we were using above. Um, but so that's what we're saying is the, the nearest neighbors for um, this y output. And so we can get a new table, which takes a second because it has to do all the um, calcs. Um, but then we can also calculate using our slope and our intercept functions, excuse me, the slope. So this is basically using linear regression instead of uh, nearest neighbor prediction. And it's just going to show us what the slope and the intercept are, um, which obviously is a much faster calculation, right? Because you don't have to go through every single uh, x value in the table and do the nearest neighbors lookup right which is a relatively expensive operation instead you can calculate the slope and the intercept almost directly does that make sense that's another reason why you want to use this technique right i mean there there are reasons to use nearest neighbor as well but like this one is generally speaking going to work for you better because it's faster um, and it basically results in, in something very, very close to the same. Uh, so it's a better choice. Um, all right. And so all we're doing here is just saying, okay, give me the prediction of the, uh, or no, that's a prediction. No, it's actually just the height. I was thinking it was whole the prediction. So yeah, so let's look at this. So we know that the we have at least one example in here that's of uh, where the mid parent height is 69 inches and <coughs> sorry, uh, point or, you know 69 and a half inches give or take. Um, and so we can look at our other table, which has our predictions on it using the nearest neighbor predictions, and we can see you know it's these are all the same height. Uh, for the mid parent, and this is what it's predicting the child is. Um, and you know, there's a fair amount of variability there, right? <coughs> so, what we hope is that with our linear, oh, oop, I forgot I was supposed to do something else. <laughs> Yeah, so you saw me do it before. Does anybody have any ideas about how we could get the, um, what are we actually looking for here? Um, like like how, how could we get the set of predictions using the linear regression technique versus using the uh, nearest neighbor technique? So may remember how to do it. I want to take a stab at it in Jupyter Notebook. So remember, we have the function. Well, the actually, let's do it this way. So we know what we want is the estimate of y here, right? So we need something that's going to take the slope, multiply it by x, and add the intercept, right, for each value of x. And so.
Any ideas? So what's the first thing we should start with? Right? We know we have the values here, right? We know what the slope and the intercept are. So what's the first thing we want to put in our code? What's the first value? All right, nobody has any ideas. Remember, we're not looking necessarily for the whole thing yet. Just tell me what, what's the first thing I need to put in here to calculate this right here. Part of the reason I'm waiting is because I think it's easier than you think it is. Because we've already done most of the math already. Uh, sort of. Um, but what, what you want is we need the, the actual value from the linear regression. So we know we want to do the actual linear regression. We don't, we don't need an individual example. We need the slope, right? So we do the slope and then going back to this function here, or this uh, equation here, we just do multiplied by um, our X, which is our heights, column, wow, um, mid-parent, right? So that's where our X's come from, right? And then we just add what number? We just add the intercept which is just as we define we calculated it earlier and then we can get the heights with those predictions so now we have our nearest neighbor predictions but now we also have our regression prediction prediction um which still seem a little off right um but you know they're they're as nearly where the nearest neighbor prediction is so you know we're getting there um and, you know, if we wanted to make this a slightly longer kind of, you know, with less in between steps, you know, we can actually calculate the intercept and the slope directly in here by just doing And then adding on the intercept, which is just this function. Let's do That uh, should work. Assuming my points are right. Yep. Um, so we can actually, I mean, we can directly calculate it each time, right? Except that's really expensive to calculate the slope and the intercept every time we go through the loop, right? Because we're basically going through a loop by that height dot column mid pair means, you know, plug this X each time. Go get HX, right? And plug it into this calculation. 
So calculating it this way is significantly more expensive than calculating it this way, because we can we can stick the slope and the intercept off into variables because we only they're the exact same thing every time you go through the loop. Right. So it's not obvious that there's a loop necessarily there. If you think about it, right, you know you have to go through and get this value, like these two, actually, well, this one too, but you have to go through this and get this value and this value every time for every one of these. And it's probably not smart enough even to reuse anything. So it's actually going to go through it, uh, whatever, a thousand ish times. So it's much better to pre calculate it and then you just you you know pre calc everything you can basically all right and then oh that's what for us um let me blast this I sh it should be figuring it out though, but it might be because the uh, comments there. Let me uh, let me just move this. Now it's definitely there. There we go. Oh, uh, all right, so now we just have the two. Um, and so now we can see, right, our nearest neighbor prediction is the yellow dots, right? And then the blue dots um, are, they're really a line but it's only because, think about it for a second, um, when we're plotting it, okay, it's not, we're not telling it to plot a line. What we're doing is plotting each of the predictions that we're using the line. Does that make sense? So it's only gonna show us blue dots where there is a, a mid-parent value, even though that blue thing is actually a line for real, okay? So we could just plot a line, which is what we were doing back here. Uh, right, we could just plot a line in there by giving it a slope and an intercept and just, you know, draw it in there directly. But we wanna show you, excuse me, that you can actually use the predicted values um, and get the answer. So, but just kind of keep in mind, right, that blue thing is a line unlike the yellow dots, which are individual points that happen to look kind of like a line. Does that make sense? Yeah. The reason I pointed out is because if we get to it uh, today, there's a later thing where it's even more pronounced that that's what's happening. Um, all right, oops. Okay, so. Uh, this one, we're, we're going to wait for this one, so you all have to figure this out. All right. So, of course, has a midterm with an average grade of 70 um, and a standard deviation of 10. And then a really hard final with an average of 50 and a standard deviation of 12. If the scatter diagram comparing the midterm and final scores for students has an oval shape with a correlation of 0.75, then what do you expect the average final score would be for students who scored 90 on the midterm? So the first thing I wanna ask is, um, actually, let's do it this way. Um, and make sure I don't screw it up too badly. Um, okay, so does anybody know how to approach this problem? Because it is, like I said, this is another one of those things where I think it's way easier than it looks. So how can you guess, or what would be the guess of 
somebody who got a 90, all right, what are they gonna get on the final? And this is the magic of standard deviation. All right, so we'll talk about how you approach it, which is basically you take the standard, uh, you take the average, okay, and you calculate the number of standard deviations away from the average that they actually score. Okay, so how many standard deviations is this from that? Yeah. Uh, now I have to math. Um, written this down huh? uh i think you're really close but i think you have uh an arithmetic error i think so yeah so okay so you missed a step which is that the correlation has to come into account. So it's two standard deviations away, exactly right. However, the correlation is 0.75. So therefore it's 0.75 of the two standard deviations. So therefore uh, 0.75 of 20, right, would be 1.5 standard deviations. Sorry, actually, let me say it differently. It's two standard deviations. So what's 0.75 of two is 1.5, right? So that means that their final score or the final exam score will be one and a half standard deviations from the average, okay? Which is 12 plus six, right? So it would be 60, wait, eight, right? Uh, I had four stuck in my head because you said 74. Um, so basically like your approach was exactly right. You just have to take into the fact that now we have this correlation number, which is not always one. And so therefore it's 0.75, right? Um, all right, so what would be, what about the 60? What would be, what would be the expected grade on the final B if the midterm was a 60? Oh, I should have done the math first, huh? Uh, let's see. Forty. What'd you say? Forty. Four. Forty-four is correct. Uh, can you explain how you did it, though? Why is it one standard deviation away? So 70 minus 60, actually think about it the reverse to get the numbers right, right? So 60 minus 70, which is negative 10, right? So that's one standard deviation. Oh, you know what? I just point five. So that's why I was wrong. Um, so, okay, so 0.75 of, so we have to do, sorry, uh, we know it's exactly uh, 0.75 because it's just one, right? So one times 0 0.75, 0 0.75 of 12 is eight, nine, nine. Yes, yeah, so it's 40. 41. Um, this is why I usually write the answers down so I don't have to try to do math in my head. Um, so 41, because what you want to do is subtract. Now you have to subtract that number, right? Because they did less well than the average. So you expect them to do less well on the final. Um, and so there'll be a 41 um, on the score. So uh, arithmetic aside, that's the approach. Um, and what I was gonna say was here, what's interesting though, is that, um, you know, we were kind of talking about this before is like, uh, like last time, you know, having a correlation of one is very, very unusual. Even in a scenario like this, is that it'll tend to be less than one. So, in a set, so like I said, weirdly enough, usually if you have a midterm average of 70, um, 
you're not going to have the same number of standard deviations away from the average as you do the next time. Okay, it will be lower or a lower difference. So, you know, in fact, right, you did th this person, in a sense, did better on the final than this person. They didn't get as good a score, right? But they improved more. Does that make sense? So, uh, kind of one of those weird things. I think there's math that proves it, um, but that's all I got. All right. So, uh, this is uh, the reason we point this out and kind of beat it to death a bit is because, um, you know, a lot of the time when you're doing this stuff, you're kind of mixing uh, units together. And so, uh, you know, your X might be one unit, right? And your Y might be another. And keeping track of which one's which can be confusing and lead to really weird errors. Um, and so, for this, if we're talking about, um, you know, the R in this, you know, scenario, right? So if we want to predict candy prices in dollars from the sugar content in grams, what would the units be of R? This is another one that's easier than it looks. And also kind of a trick question. So what, you know, what, what is our measure? Like what kind of thing? Sort of, so standard units. So not exactly. So like the R is something, right? I mean, it's a value of things. Those things are standard units, okay? They're not dollars and they're not whatever it was, pounds, grants, right? They're standard units. Okay, so in other words, when you're if you're working with these, right, you need to shift it to standard units first, because otherwise you can't get to it all. Make sense? Okay. What about the slope? So a slope is is essentially like almost like a division, right? So it's dollars per gram. Okay, is what the slope would be in. Okay. Um, and this, I uh, personally, I think this one is like kind of the most confusing from a, like knowing kind of what units to or whatever, because, you know, if you're writing about it, right, you have to carry around this term dollars per gram as one like word almost, right? So you got to think of them as, you know, it's a unit when you say dollars per gram, even though it sounds like it's two. Does that make sense? So, you know, you want to think about them almost as a block. And then the intercept, what's the intercept uh, unit? This is the easiest one of the three because it's the only one that's like normal. <laughs> All right, so we know the intercept is where the line crosses the X axis, right? So the Y value when it crosses the X axis. So, because we're, we're trying to predict candy prices, which is the Y side of the equation, right? So we can reverse the X's and the Y's and all that, you know, if we really want to, but normally what we're talking about is, you know, all the math that we're doing is taking X as an input and Y is our output or our prediction, right? So that means that Y would be, or the intercept would be in dollars. Make sense? All right. Um, it's funny, in, in explaining this slide, it's much more complicated than I think I realized when I wrote it, so. Um, all right, so let's talk about least squares. Where is this going? Okay, um, so least squares is really a discussion about um, how do we start to know whether how accurate we are, okay? 
Um, and we'll explain why it's called least squares uh, as we get to it. But to start off with, uh, we're just going to look at a different data set. Um, this, <clears throat> excuse me, happens to be congressional district and how they voted, but we don't actually care about that part. What we're going to look at here is the median income and uh, the percent of those people that went to college. Okay. Um, and so to do that, we're just going to drop some of the columns, right, that we don't care about just so that everything's more efficient. Uh, and now we see that, you know, the median income is $47,000 and 24% of those people went to college. Okay. Um, but this is by uh, district. Right, so so even though we threw out this district information, the group we're talking about here is not like a state, right, or the country. It's just a district, which you know I want to say is it's like a few thousand people usually, um, or maybe maybe a bit more. Is it that big? Oh, I'm thinking precincts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. districts are. Yeah, you might set right. So yeah, sorry, districts are. Yeah, seven hundred thousand. Let's say. Um, they're bigger than a bread box, but they're also not uh, the size of a state. Well, some states are 700,000, but there you go. All right. Okay, so first thing we want to do is we're just going to throw it on a scatter plot. Um, and I may have, we may have looked at this example a little bit last time. I can't remember if we did this. Um, but, you know, we can see it's kind of going up to the right, right? So we expect some sort of positive correlation there. Um, and then we want to take, I mean, I wouldn't take a wild guess, but okay. So it looks like it thinks it is about eight or 0.8, let's just call it, um, is the correlation between the two. Um, and so then where did I? So then we basically do the exact same or certain amount of time. So um, I'm going to move it right along. So then we kind of do what we did uh, with the other one, which is let's calculate the individual pieces so we can do a linear regression on this um, uh, data set. Uh, so first we calculate the slope by just using our fancy slope function. We also calculate the intercept. Um, and you know we want to make sure we get our x's and y's correct uh and then we'll see that we get um uh you know our two kind of values here so um you know this this twenty thousand here is kind of a weird number right because this is the income the average income for a district where no one goes to college which doesn't really probably exist, right? Um, but it's still where the line, right, that we're making still has to cross it somewhere. So there's always an intercept, even if it doesn't make any sense, all right? Um, even, even a negative dollar value here would still exist on the line, but it just really doesn't make any sense. Um, and then this is our slope. Um, and so, now we have the data points we need to be able to calculate or create a lock, right? Um, and so because we have those two things, we can now create and going back to uh, kind of best fit lines or whatever, this little function is called fitted value. So what it's doing is um, it, it's taking the, our slope and our intercept, okay, of, the, of whatever we passed in, and then it's giving you a position on the line. Okay, so it's giving you a fit, like a fitted spot. Okay, um, and that it's basically all derivative of like best fit. All right, um, and so we can do all. Oh, you know what? Did I run this? No. Um, so we can then take our whole table. Actually, let's just. Oh, we'll look at it as the graph. Um, but so now we can take our whole table, we can pass it to this function, right? And for each um, value of X, okay? In this case, it would be college percentage. Um, 
we can calculate what we expect the y to be. Okay. So now we have a set of predictions um, that happen to also appear uh, in like uh, every x that we have here, right? We also have a y value already. So we know we have a source, what's sometimes referred to as a source of truth. So we know what the y's are for these x's, but now we've also added to the table a prediction of what we think it would be. Because what we want to know is, is like how accurate is it, right? Um, so that we can determine whether we want to use this in the future where we don't know, we don't have correct values, right? We don't have a source of truth. So in order to do that, um, you know, and one of the things that I know I regularly forget is we can just subtract these things um, by just pulling out, right? So we can just take this array and subtract that array and we'll get our error, like our difference between the two sets, which we're gonna call errors. Um, and now we're gonna add it to the table, at least temporarily, so we can see, okay, our um, median income, right? And here's our prediction. So given, you know, college percentage of 24 and a half percent, then our median income, we expect to be 51,000 or nearly 52,000. Um, however, in fact, it's only 50,000, okay? So we know that there's a difference here of about $1.3,000, okay? So this is basically just telling us how far off our predictions are from our source of truth, okay? So then, you know, one of the techniques we've been using, right, to look at errors, right, is we, we try to average the errors and try to get a value out of there uh, that tells us, like, how far are we away in general, right? However, um, and to quote, I think, Homer Simpson, um, <laughs> when we do the, the average of the errors, we end up with zero. Right, I mean, you know, not really, but if, if we round it out, it's you know, it's point thirteen zeros, then a six, right? Which is pretty close to zero. So we'll call that zero. So that's not very useful. So does anybody remember a technique we've used to account for this problem? And the reason, right, is because if you look back at our picture, our errors are going to be both positive and negative off of the line, right? And if the line is actually pretty good, what does that mean the average error is going to be? Every time. Any idea? Or think about it a different way. What if our line, like our predicted value, was like here? All the values, all the errors, right, would be positive, right? So the average would be some positive number, right? If my yellow line was going straight kind of up there, all my values would be negative, right? And so my average value would be about, it would be some negative number. But where it is, because it's pretty good, what's that mean is gonna happen with the average every time? We've had this problem before. Yeah, so it's always gonna be zero. Right, because it, it's what's weird about here, right, is that what we care about is distance from the line. We don't actually care about whether the value is positive or negative. Does that make sense? We want to know how far away it is. We don't really care if it's a if it's a, if it's correct or if it's uh, you know badly incorrect, far away on the positive side or far away on the negative side. It doesn't really make any difference. It's still wrong, right? Um, so one way we can deal with that is we could look at like absolute values. However, uh, a lot of times in these kinds of scenarios, um, like I said, we've done it before, we actually square, okay? And the reason we square it, and if you go, I think it was in chapter 17, they talked about this more. Um, the reason we square it is because it'll actually magnify the, the worst differences, okay? Or it'll magnify, it'll magnify the, the problem you have. So 
in that way, it kind of gives us a, a more valuable estimate of our error. Does that make sense? Because we're kind of manufacturing stuff here anyway, right? What we're trying to do is get a sense. We want a comparable way of looking at this error versus some other lines error, right? We don't, the, the real numbers don't really matter that much because what we're, all we're looking for is like, you know, is this line closer or less close than what we want it to be? Um, so we can square it. Um, and I'm going to cheat a little bit here by using this acronym here, which is mean square error. Okay. Um, and the reason we use it is because we're going to talk about it as MSE a lot. So I put it in here now. So all we do is we square the error first, and then we take the average. The problem is now we have a number that is, let's see, 88 million, all right, which is not exactly in the scale of numbers that we were talking about before. So uh, what we want to do is take the square root so we can kind of get it back in the same units that we were messing with before. Um, and intuitively enough, we're going to call that the RMSE, right, which is the root mean square error. And as you hear me try to say it, you'll see why we use the acronym law. Um, so now we're talking about, about $9,000, okay? So our, our line estimate is about $9,000 off on average, okay? Um, with some, you know, characteristics of that magnifying because the root, you know, that kind of stuff, but the distance in dollars from the line to the, the values that are correct is about $9,000. So that tells us, right, that if we can get this number to be lower, then we'll have a better prediction, right? So that's what we would like to do. Um, but before we get there, eh, we have one minute or a couple minutes left. Um, so, oops. Uh, so this is just a handy function to kind of like help visualize it. Um, and of course, we're going to get unscrolling output. Okay, so uh, and we'll and we'll talk about this more next time too. But um, you know, this is a well-known data set to me, right? So as a result, we put the line in, and then these red lines are some examples of the error. Okay, but it's just arbitrary points on this x-axis that are kind of chosen at random, just to kind of show you the error difference, right? So. When we did it initially, right, we took the actual slope and the intercepts, but let's say, you know what, let's just try stuff, okay? Um, and so as you can see, right, our red lines in this one are sometimes longer. This one's definitely longer. Um, you know, this one's flipped, but it's actually shorter. Um, but then we can kind of do another one and see how that looks. Uh, and that's wildly wrong, right? So just to give you the idea of, um, oh, it's actually printing this. Um, but yeah, just to give you the idea of, you know, now we have a little function that will let us uh, kind of look for visually what the error difference is. Um, and so what we can do then is kind of do the same thing. I didn't realize I had these basically two copies of these, but um, <coughs> so now we see with that root mean squared error, right? So this one's 30K off, right? Versus our nine-ish K off that we had before, right? Um, and then here's another arbitrary line as well. Um, and we see, okay, this one's about, you know, what 11 and a half K difference, uh, you know, on average. Um, and then, but if we go back to the slope and the intercept, um, but I'll tell you a secret, right? Which is that, that data, like this choice, is the best choice. Okay, this, if we do the regression slope and we do the regression intercept, we will get the best line we can. Okay, 
Okay. That doesn't mean it'll be great. Okay. Because if, if this plot of data, right, doesn't look right, you know, it's always going to be somewhat wrong unless it has a pure R of one, right, or something. Um, so this line is always going to be wrong. But if we use those two calcs, this both in the intercept, uh, that's the smallest uh, root mean squared error we can have. Okay. And why that's so if we can calculate that, that's great. Um, but now using all that information, right, we can now maybe do some other tricks to not have to calculate those, but instead still get to the right line. Um, but I think we will do that next time because it is 43 minutes after the hour. All right, any questions? Yeah. I, I really got to do that. I just have not. No, um, but I'll see. I, I will do it before or, or around the same time as the videos. Um, but yeah, I keep meaning to and then getting distracted. All right. Any other questions? All right. Cool. Have a lovely weekend. Oh, the I guess discussions tomorrow. So you'll see a bunch of people.